Hello, everybody, and welcome to News from Hubble and Across the Universe. This is our monthly hangout where we get to meet with Dr. Frank Summers uh, to discuss a lot of great new science and, and, and happenings in both astronomy and with the Hubble Space Telescope. My name is Tony Darnell. I work at the Space Telescope Science Institute with Frank, and welcome, Frank. It's good to see you again. Good to see you, Tony. How how everything been this last month? We haven't actually talked since July. No, I know it's been it's been a while since we've been doing this. So uh, we got a lot to catch up on. Uh, but before we get started, let me remind everybody how you can interact with us. If you want to leave comments or ask questions, we've got the Google Plus app. We've got or the Google Plus event page. We have the the Q and A app on both YouTube and Google Plus. And I'm looking at the Hubble. Hang, Hubble Hangout hashtag, although we'll probably change that for future shows, but for right now, if you want to leave a tweet, Hubble, hash, Hubble Hangout is what I'm looking at. <laughs> so, too many H's on that. It kills me every time. Um, anyway, uh, so this month, Frank is back. Like As Frank mentioned, we, we missed last month for two reasons. I was on vacation. I was one, and another was uh, uh, we just couldn't get our stuff together in time to make it happen, so... We are going to, uh, we have a lot of things to cover, and Frank, I will turn it over to you to get us started. Yeah, you know, um, I will apologize that I was out of the country. I was in, uh, up in Vancouver for a week, so we, uh, August is a, is a pretty busy month uh, for vacations and travel and such. So we will do now uh, eight extra big show, extra cool stories for you today, okay? Cool. Yeah, there's some research stuff that happened last week or last month, I think, that you covered that you're going to also cover with us. So. Exactly, and that's going to be my first story, okay? Because this happened just before I left for Vancouver. All right. So, story number one: Rosetta rendezvous with rubber ducky. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you really like that rubber ducky part, don't you? <laughs> it's just, it's, it, it, what, what do you see? What do you see? You, you know all about this. All right. So, first of all, this is about the Rosetta mission. Um, and it's a mission to a comet, uh, Comet 67P Cheryumov Gerasimenko. Uh, which, <laughs> that's a tough thing to say. Um, as you can see, pictured here, uh, they've got the Rosetta is the uh, the, the um, spacecraft with the long wings on it. That's that's the Rosetta mission itself. And then they also have the um, uh, the Philae probe that is going to land on the comet. Okay, so it's got a combination of a, f a flyby as well as a uh, probe landing on it. Although it's actually more than just a flyby. Okay, now uh, we've been past a bunch of other comets before, and as you can see in this slide here, um, the, here are what six different comets that we have visited, um, basically generally with, generally with flybys. Um, and you can see they're, you know, about five miles across from one mile to nine miles across. And they've got these oblong shapes. Um, and you know, most of them are sort of roundish or potato-ish, although I think uh, Borley and Hartley, they could, they could be bowling pin comets. All right, they look like bowling pins. But yeah, my professor always called them oblate spheroids. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, but Deep Impact actually hit, we didn't just fly by, right? Yeah, no, Deep Impact we actually did a flyby and we did a smash in. So we did <laughs> both a flyby and and we didn't land gently, okay? Uh, that's the difference with this one. This one we're going to try and land gently. Oh, with Deep Impact we actually tried to smash smash it, smash into it. We saw all, all the powdery stuff come out of it. So we've been there, we sort of know. But what we've never done is actually um, travel along with for an extended period. So this is what Rosetta is going to do. Here is the whole timeline, okay? You can try and read that. The font's, font's probably too small to read over this. But the idea is that it's, it launched in 2004, March of 2004. Okay. It's got, yeah, it got gravity assists from Earth, Mars, Earth, asteroid Steins, Earth again, uh, asteroid Lutetia, um, and... Uh, yeah, so it's got like seven different gravity assists in order to um, make its uh, new um, gravity, huh? <laughs> extra an extreme exercise in celestial mechanics. Okay, <laughs> uh, the, but the point was it arrived at the comet uh, August sixth of last month. Now it's better to understand the um, the orbits if you show it here. And so here you can see the orbital pass and all of the early uh, gravity assists were there to put it on a much more elliptical orbit so that it could match the orbit of Cheryumov Jeremisimenko. Are those does it take a lot of energy to get into an orbit like that? To an elliptical orbit? 
Um, well, yeah, um, simply because uh, you're, you're, Earth is on a, on, a, on a circuit orbit. When you launch from Earth, you're launching basically with Earth's momentum around the sun. And so you've got to change that momentum um, into a much more elongated uh, orbit. So while the, as you can see, the red line and the green line are almost coincident at one point in terms of their perihelion, the closest approach to the sun, the aphelion is so much further away for chair for Comet 67P that you've got to add a lot of energy uh, to get out to that, right? Mm -hmm. So the really cool thing about um, Rosetta mission is after it has uh, met up with the comet, it's going to stay with the comet all the way through perihelion passage. Okay? So it's not in orbit around the comet, it's just sort of tracking along in the it's, comet's orbit. Yeah, it's tracking along with it. It's doing a librating orbit uh, near the comet, actually, yeah. uh, as I saw, I saw it described once, that it's, it's in front of the comet. It's not actually orbiting around the comet. It's orbiting along with the comet. So it's on the same path at the same speed. Yes. Um, and so you can see how difficult it is, um, and if you want to do it inexpensively, to, you, to do all this sort of stuff, the amount of energy that it takes to, to match orbits. Okay. So this is really cool. We have now matched up with the comet, and I was going to go through some of the images that we had of the comet uh, pre approaching it, okay? So this is the first image released uh, this year, March 27th, uh, and the main thing in this image is the globular cluster M107, okay? So this is, I think it's in the constellation of Ophiuchus. That's M107, and then what looks like just one of the stars of M107 or the stars nearby M107, that's actually the comet. Okay, so that circle is around the comet uh, 67P, I'm calling 67P CG, just for, for... I'm glad that circle's there, it makes it, it make Rosetta easier to find. Absolutely impossible spot otherwise. <laughs> uh, then, uh, the, next thing, the next thing that was interesting that they released was on July 4th, on Independence Day in the U.S. Uh, this year, they released these three images here. And these three images show you that it's more than just a dot. It looks like sort of an elongated dot, okay? And, you know, you can't really see it. It's all very pixelated and everything. But you're starting to see that, well, this is kind of interesting. It probably has that potato shape that we've seen for all the other comets, right? But they saved the best for French Independence Day, Bastille Day, July 14th, 2014. Oh, the French release. Right. You got well. It is a European mission, right? So, yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so on, Bast <laughs> on Bastille Day, they release this image, and this immediately shows you that that dark line of shadow center shows you this looks like two objects. It looks like two snowballs hanging around each other, uh, not not one object. It looks like two objects together which was really cool. And then everything really went crazy the next week. Uh, this sequence of images from July 23rd to 27th hit the internet, and everybody started freaking out. This wasn't just a single comet. This was a contact binary comet. All right? Uh, it was absolutely amazing. This is what I call comet rubber ducky. Okay? Mm -hmm. Not just me. A lot of people have called it comet rubber ducky. <laughs> So you got to you got to explain to us what a comet uh, a binary uh, what was it you said binary Con what contact binary contact okay. binary what is that Thank you for asking because that's just where I was going to launch into <laughs> <laughs> uh, Well all right so the point is is that you know you it's obviously two separate pieces that have joined together um, at the neck of the duck and in order for these things now comets can be relatively fragile objects right Comets um, can be just ru sort of rubble piles or ice as their snowballs. Uh, if they came together too hard, they would smash and break up. Okay, and uh, what the calculations were on this one was that for these two objects to stick together, they had to approach each other at a speed of like three meters per second. Now, three meters per second is fast for you and me, but in the solar system, that's actually quite slow because Earth orbits around the Sun at 30 kilometers per second. So in order to match up, the, these two objects had to be almost on exactly the same orbits and, very, uh, and, and, and then just sort of gently smash in together um, and stay in contact with one another. Uh, so it's really interesting. We don't know 
how strongly they're held together. They obviously are held strongly enough to resist the, the rotation, the rotational forces that might pull them apart. Right, I was going to uh, say that that must be acting against it. So it's hard to imagine this is just gravity doing the the sticking together, is it? Or do you think that's all it is? Well, I mean, it's 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 gravity plus there can be some chemical bonds, you know, and what holds a snowball together, right? Yeah, they kind of got squished together like a packing a snowball. I think it melted a little bit and kind of stuck together. I mean, you can consider this a solar system exploration in making a snowman. Right. Uh, you get a third one, okay, and then you, you get, we can have a snowman comet, but I think that's highly unlikely to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that bringing that together would be impressive. Okay, so this got everyone's attention on it. Um, I think, from what I heard, some of these images were released um, prematurely. Uh, the, the, the team, the science team behind it didn't want to release them until they really knew what they were looking at, but it was just so cool. Somebody had to, some, uh, somebody had to, to, to put it out. Um, and so the next week they actually released some earlier images from the OSIRIS team that actually had even higher resolution and you can really see this, this double contact binary. So we were watching really closely as it was going into Rendezvous, which was on Oct August 6th. So here on July 24th, based upon those da that data, they made this uh, animated GIF, this spinning 3D model, okay? So a rough model of it where you can see you've got a larger one that looks very much like the ones we've got. We've got a smaller circular one. Again, the two of them separately look very much like uh, the other comets we've seen, but then they get smashed together by this neck feature. All right, August 1st, we start to see all the detail in it. Uh, all of the cragginess that we saw in all the previous comets starts to come into view. We get a little closer daily, uh, August nice. 3rd. Look at that. <laughs> I mean, that almost looks like a mushroom cloud type I'm not going off. No, no. Yeah, really. It looks like he just got hit by an atomic bomb. I was gonna, the, the rubber ducky's out the window now. I don't see it. <laughs> uh, don't worry, rubber ducky will come back. Okay, uh, that one, this one had a feeling like a mushroom club. But what I loved about this one is it showed you the narrow features of the neck and how tenuous the connection yeah. is between them. Right? Yeah. Um, it's as if they smashed together and rebounded, and you formed this bridge uh, there, and then just no material was left in between on that. So that was really cool to me. Yeah. Uh, it's almost like it, when it, they, they, they kind of hit and then heat it up, sort of merged and squished and melted a little bit. Then when they started to go apart, it froze. That's what I think happened, Frank. That's okay. <laughs> I'll get the Nobel Prize later. I just wanted to say what I think it was. <laughs> All right. Well, that is a reasonable reasonable hypothesis. Uh, you just have to calculate what the, the speeds and the physical properties that would happen during that before mm -hmm. you get your Nobel Prize, though. Yeah, Emily, Emily, is she on the team? No. Um, uh, I'll tell you at the end of this that oh. I still... To the easiest place to steal all the images, these images was from her blog. Okay? <laughs> yeah, she's really great. At that. Yeah, <laughs> she yeah. was really good. So, in, I mean, I got a lot of things from a lot of places, and it was just like uh, to try and assemble it for this talk. It was like, ah, eh, we'll just go to Emily. And yeah, she, yeah. She, she's got it. She'll she, know. What, she'll have a deal. <laughs> she reprocessed a bunch of these images to clean them up and make them look better before posting on her blog. So nice um, she added her uh, added her name to the credit list. Very nice. Actually, the credit lists are. Monstrously huge for this. <laughs> Just and some of these. Yeah. Some of these are. Anyway, so August fourth again, you see some serious, uh, craggy and, and bumpy features and stuff. It's really, you know, taking shape. It's starting to be a real object. Okay, um, and then after August fourth, uh, on August sixth, we had rendezvous. And Rendezvous was successful. They did the uh, insertion burn to slow down to get to the, the speed of the comet because they've been catching up to the comet. And then they slowed down, and they're, and they're in this liberating orbit around it, uh, basically in front of it, looking at it uh, with the cameras. Well, after Rendezvous, they were so close that they were only getting pieces of the comet. They couldn't show you the whole comet. Oh, the camera, they have wide enough field of view, huh? Right. Well, you know, you're, you want to be that close because you've got to scan places um, for where this lander is going to look, mm -hmm. going to land, right? right. Um, so they released a mosaic like this, okay, of four different images. Um, and then they said to uh, image processors, okay, here are the four images that we took that mosaic over the whole thing. How about if you go out and try and mosaic them together because, you know, as the as the as the 
orbiter is, is moving around it, um, the lighting is going to change, the, the, the comet's going to rotate a little bit, so it requires a significant amount of image processing to combine these guys together, right? Uh, and so a gentleman named Daniel Machacek put together this uh, one from the August 31st mosaic, and that, I think, is really cool. And although it looks kind of mean, it there certainly does look like a rubber duck there, don't you think? Yeah, I guess so, I guess so. <laughs> While you're talking about this, Frank, I want to interject a comment from Judy Schmidt. She's made a comment about what you're saying. She said, uh, despite how the photos look and it and being a snowball, the comet is actually very dark in color. Always surprising to learn how dark some things are, like the moon is pretty much charcoal. So That, that is you. correct. Yep. Thank you, Judy. Good, good insight. That's true. This is what you're looking at. Of course, is the reflections from the sun. Uh, and, but this is a pretty dark object. Yeah. The um, standard thing is that the uh, a comet is as dark as the asphalt on the road. Okay, and that because it's been traveling around in outer space for billions of years. Uh, uh, any particles that hit it, you know, cover up all the quote quote snow. Uh, you don't see white snow on comets, okay? Because the outer layer is sort of this tarry, gooky stuff. The inner layers are white and bright and would be would would be would be your snow-like substances. But the outer layers have definitely been uh, baked uh, in the uh, solar heat. Um, all of the volatiles on the surface have evaporated away, leaving behind this sort of tar-like residue. Okay, so there's your there's your rubber duck. Okay, but here's the question, and the question that they're studying this month is where on this rubber duck are they going to land? Okay, where are they going to put that lander? The beak. The, <laughs> the um, the problem is, is that because it's got this irregular shape, uh, the orbit around it is actually not that difficult. You know, it's just an irregular um, moment of inertia to work with. But now you've got to try and land on this while it's rotating with this kind of irregular shape. So that sort of lit some of the places that are possible to land. And so the plan was to come up with five potential landing sites uh, toward the end of August, which they did. Uh, and here is a refined 3D model um, and with the five potential landing sites for the Philae lander. Um, a, they, <laughs> obviously, they, they chose a lot more because they got A, B, and C, but then they have I and J. Yeah, so, I think. The, the I don't know what got dismissed. D through H seem to have disappeared. They didn't make the cut. Yeah. Didn't make the cut. All right. So these are the five potential landing sites, cool. and then they released some high-resolution photographs of those landing sites. So here's the A, B, C, I, and J landing sites. Um, the scale on this is one kilometer. Uh, on a side for each of these, right? So that's really interesting, okay? Um, I actually look at these pictures, and my favorite landing site might be Site B because it looks uh, much s sort of like a lunar mare, very smooth. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. I predict that's what they'll I, I think it's B. B should be the one. The other ones look too scary. Yeah, um, but what they're going to do is they're going to survey these five sites at a resolution of what they said, like, you know, uh, half a meter per pixel, which is amazing. Um, but since they're that close, they will look at these sites in great detail um, at about half a meter per pixel resolution, and then before they choose their primary landing site. And uh, I'm told that their uh, primary landing site will be chosen in mid-September. So we got a couple weeks before we'll find out what the primary landing site is. So let me ask you this, Frank. The, the spinning of the comet and the, the rotation and the fact that they found out this thing is not a very regular object, does that substantially complicate the, uh, the orbiting or the landing equations that are going to be needed or the trajectories? Or are they, are they concerned about that at all, do you know? Well, they uh, very quickly, uh, when they made the initial models of it, from what I understand, they recognized that the, like, they couldn't really land on the neck, okay? Uh, just because of the way the, the, the rotation of it, trying to get into the neck might not be a really good spot. Okay, okay. so I guess if I go to the previous one, you can see that they've got uh, three sites that are on the top of the head, yeah. um, and then they've got two sites on what I would call the tail of the duck. Okay. They're going to land on his butt, Site C. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so landing on the duckie's tail or landing on the duckie's head seem to be the favored sites, uh, both in terms of the orbital mechanics of it and perhaps in terms of the smoothness of the site for, for a landing, right? Cool. 
That is awesome. Yeah, neat. So, uh, here is a point where I say amazing things about Ms. Emily Lakdawalla. Of, uh, she never say too many. Yes, yeah, so she writes a blog for the Planetary Society, and I just want to give her a tip of the hat, not a wag of the finger, a tip of the hat, because uh, so many, it was easy just to go through a lot of her blog posts and pull out images for this. Um, I will note that the landing uh, for Philae will occur uh, starting on November 11th. The orbital maneuver will start on November 11th, and it will land on November 19th. So yeah. for Thanksgiving, we may be serving duck, okay? <laughs> In rubber form. Uh, rubber duck for Thanksgiving, okay? <laughs> nice. Well, that's great. No, and Emily is an outstanding resource for anybody who wants to keep abreast of the absolute latest. Her Twitter feed is also a, a really a good source. I follow it. And I learn more from that about that. That's my always like Frank, one of my first choices to go to. So all right, yeah, so that's uh, story number one. Uh, I got three more, which are a little bit, little bit shorter. Uh, this and then we actually and, and in these ones we actually get back to Hubble because there wasn't really a Hubble tie-in for Comet Rubber Ducky there. No, <laughs> Hubble's not. Like that. Okay, so our second story today is big bursts of star formation in distant dwarf galaxies. Now, what we're really talking about here are star-bursting galaxies, okay? Galaxies that have these immense amounts of star formation. And one of the prime uh, examples to, to point to is the antennae galaxies shown here. Um, you can see there are two heads and then these two long tails that go off from each other. Uh, these two galaxies uh, were determined about almost, uh, see, it was the 1970s, so that, that's 40 years ago, it was determined that these two galaxies um, have been on a collision, okay? And well, longer so, than 40 years. Uh, yes, the collision lasts about a billion years. <laughs> <laughs> but it was 40 years ago when the Tomb Ray brothers uh, were actually able to deduce and show from computer simulations, very, very, very simple, simple computer simulations back then, that the two galaxies were actually, in the fact, of colliding. And we believe that the collision incites star formation. And that star formation is greatly seen when we go to this Hubble image of just the central part of it. And you can see all those bright pink regions, which are star forming regions, and all those bright blue stars, which are hot, newborn, st massive stars. So all those pink regions are, are areas where stars are currently being born within this collision. Right, and they are they are regions that make the Orion Nebula look puny. All right, now the Orion Nebula is one of our, our closest and our fa most favorite star forming regions. It's got like about four thousand stars uh, forming within it. Uh, these are super star clusters that are forming here with tens of thousands of stars and and, and lots of lots and lots of stars in in, the, in their formation. Uh, so you know these are really big. These are big star forming regions. Uh, there's a ton of star formation going on in here, and that's what defines a starburst. Okay. Are there any uh, preference to the kinds of stars being born here? Are, there, are they a specific type of star, or are they just all kinds? No, we've found that uh, when you form stars, you tend to form stars of all different masses. You form, your, 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 you form a few really big, massive stars, and then a lot of faint um, uh, stars. I think the um, average... The average um, size of a star in a star-forming region is only uh, seven-tenths of the size of the sun. Uh, stars can go up to hundreds of times the size of the sun and down to about a, a tenth the size of the sun, but the, the average mass um, is about uh, seven-tenths the size of the sun. So um, you, for all the really big stars that you can see here, there are lots more small stars that, of course, uh, you can't see. So um, starburst, we believe, are induced by an event. Uh, normal galaxies just don't have this much star formation going on. Here the event is the merging of uh, two galaxies. So we wanted to, when we've studied starbursts, we want to actually study the star formation history of the universe. And these starbursting galaxies are the easiest ones to study because they've got so much star formation going on in them. And as we looked out into the distant universe, uh, we use these deep images from Hubble. We've been able to study starbursting in the big galaxies and even some of the medium-sized galaxies. So as we look out into the universe and the formation of stars, and we find that the, uh, the peak of star formation was about uh, four or five billion years after the Big Bang. 
Okay, um, we sort of look in the redshift range uh, one to two, um, which is about two billion years after the Big Bang to about six or seven billion years after the Big Bang. Okay, so that that region, was the period when most of the stars in the universe were were born. Okay. Exactly. Okay. So those are sort of the peak of star formation in the universe. And so we've looked at the star bursting galaxies uh, in those range, but only the medium and large ones. And with the Wide Field Camera 3, and in particular the increased infrared sensitivity of WIFC 3 on Hubble, we've been able to extend those studies to sa sample the smaller galaxies. And so this image here, there are, there are six red circles around six of the um, small dwarf galaxies that they found to be starbursting. Okay? Um, and they were able to study these dwarf galaxies um, in the, having starbursts between two and six billion years out there. Uh, and that's really important because dwarf galaxies are the most numerous galaxies in the universe. Just like I said that, you know, there are many more smaller stars than there are big stars, there are also many more smaller galaxies than there are big galaxies. So if these dwarf galaxies are undergoing starbursts as well, well, then they could have a significant effect. And it turns out that they have a really huge star formation, um, that they can double the number of stars in them within only 100 million or 150 million years. So wait, uh, why is that? So why is that so significant? If dwarf, because dwarf galaxies are the most common type of galaxy, or the, they're the most numerous of the galaxies. Exactly, and they're so the most. If they're, if they're showing a lot of rapid star formation, then there's a lot more stars than we think there are. Maybe exactly. Uh, if only you know, ten percent of your population is doing something, right? Um, well, then that sort of says, well, you know, it's 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 a it's a it's a good subgroup, but it might not be able to dominate what's really going on. But if 90% of your population is doing something, well, just by sheer number, uh, they can dominate. Um, I guess we could relate it to the, uh, the, the, the post-war generation, right? The baby boomers, how they've had so much population here in the U.S. and they've been able to dominate culture as they go through their lives, etc. Uh, so you want the, the, the more, most massive population, uh, find out what they're doing, um, uh, then you'll get a better handle on what's overall happening, right? Well, I don't. I, I don't mean to. I don't mean to put you on the spot here. And so, I mean, if, you <laughs> if you don't know the answer, that's okay. But do you have a sense of how much? How many? In, in terms of percent, is it like ten percent more stars, twenty percent more stars than we thought, fifty percent more stars? I'll get to that. Thought? I'll get to that number at the at the, at the end of oh, this. Okay, good. I don't want to steal your punchline. I just. I, I'm not going to give you my punchline until until I'm ready for Fair it. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> but we're very close to this. Okay, okay, so these are in the range of what we call extreme emission line galaxies, EELGs, okay? They, we're measuring their star formation by looking at the hydrogen alpha line, okay? So the amount of hydrogen uh, emission that's coming on there, which we found to be a very good measure of star formation, um, and that they are producing stars, you know, 100 times more rapidly than normal galaxies, and even several times uh, more rapidly than our normal starbursts in the large ga galaxies. So when you add up all of these uh, dwarf galaxies and the extreme starbursting that they're going through, they calculate, well, depending on how you do things, they could cover about 13 to 34 percent of the star formation going on between two and six billion years after the Big Bang. So they can account for up to one-third of all the star formation happening at that time. Previously, we didn't have any information on the dwarfs, and, you know, should the dwarfs be, uh, they're, they're awfully, awfully small, you know, they're down to like 1% the size of a big galaxy. Uh, should they really be, be, be considered? Well, the answer is yes. It's very surprising just how much they may, might, might contribute. Okay, so let, let me just go back for a minute here. Sure. We, we've all seen this pie chart of the composition of the universe where all the matter that we know in the universe is like 4 or 5%. Dark matter makes up 20 or some odd 25 percent, and dark energy makes up the remaining 70 percent. What okay. effect is this going to do, if any, on that <laughs> 5 percent slice of pie? Okay, so that 5 percent slice of pie will stay the same. Okay, it doesn't it's not changing the amount of baryonic matter in the universe, the normal matter in the universe, right? So that's, it, that's conserved, then I guess. Okay. It's all, okay. that, that 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 doesn't have an effect here. 
what this does have is where do the stars that we see today get born? Are they born in large galaxies? Are they born in medium galaxies? Or are they born in, star, in small galaxies? What this result is saying is that up to a third of them may be born in small galaxies. Good. All right, and then if they I wanted to make because I I don't I don't want people to think we've discovered a whole bunch of stars that we didn't know were there before. <laughs> it's it's all they're just we're getting a better idea of where and how these stars are forming and when in the history of the universe. Right? Exactly. Okay. We know that we we can under, we can approximate the stellar content of the universe today, and we're trying to figure out how wh when did they form and where did they form. We figured out where when they formed it appears, but now we're seeing that they actually more of them form in small galaxies than we had previously suspected. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Frank. That's cool. That is that story. And we're going to move on to another uh, star-bursting uh, object. Uh, we're going to call it, uh, talk about a baby elliptical. We've talked about rubber duckies. Now we're going to go a cute little baby elliptical galaxy here. <laughs> so uh, when we think of ellipticals... I didn't know there was such a thing, to be honest. <laughs> Well, you've never seen one before. That's the point of this story. Okay, when you think of ellipticals, you don't think of cute little objects. Okay, maybe there are some dwarf ellipticals that are small. Yeah, they're the um, largest galaxies in the universe. These right. Okay, so this image here is of uh, the Perseus cluster of galaxies. All right, um, and because it's far away, right? Most of the galaxies here are roughly the same distance, so you can actually compare sizes. Uh, one to another. And you can see that the largest ones here are these elliptical galaxies near the center. Uh, you can pick out a few spiral galaxies in here and they're all considerably smaller. So you've got these giant elliptical galaxies, okay? I'm sorry, did and you see how far away this cluster was? I did not. I actually just wanted to use this as an example of giant ellipticals. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> uh, very, they're, all very the same. they're all about the same. Distance. All about the same way, very far away. They're hundreds of millions of light years away. How about that? Yeah, okay. All right. Um, and so we got these giant ellipticals, and we believe that since they exist, at, that we find them a lot at the cores of clusters, that they uh, accrete their, uh, their mass by merging. Okay, I showed you one image of merging previously, but at the center of a cluster of galaxies, you would naturally get more merging, uh, and that was where you find these giant ellipticals. But, so we can see how they grow, but we wanted to know how do these giant ellipticals start? These, these galaxies that become the, these big galaxies, how do they really start? And we can look back out, and out into these uh, deep images. All right, um, we can take a look at, uh, this is... Uh, a, a galaxy in the coma cluster, an elliptical galaxy in the coma cluster, um, and so they have these dense cores at their center, right? and we believe that these must form relatively early on in the universe, okay? because you've got very old stars in here. And we can account for growth via merging, um, and we can look out into the universe and trace them back, but what we really wanted to find is that formation of that core, right? and we hadn't been able to see that yet. Okay, we wanted to find the formation of that, that, that initial core, which probably grew very, very, very fast. Well, we did one of these deep images of the universe, uh, searching for this. And again, using the infrared capabilities of WIFC3, just letting you know that the infrared is, is, is proving to be extremely useful on WIFC3, they identified this object here, this uh, orangish object here, as, as being a really good candidate for being the core of what would become a future elliptical galaxy. Now, what are the special characteristics of this object that make it, so, make it a candidate? Well, it's really tiny. Uh, it's about 6,000 light years across, whereas a galaxy like our Milky Way is 100,000 light years across. 6,000 versus 100,000. So this is smaller even um, than uh, the, the, the bulge of our Milky Way galaxy, the core of, uh, of a large galaxy. It's smaller than that. But already this object uh, has as many stars in it as are in our entire Milky Way galaxy. So it's a ton of stars compressed down to a very small region. Furthermore, this object is seen at a redshift of 2.3, which places it 
um, at 3 billion years after the Big Bang, or 11 about 11 billion years ago. So this is an object that uh, happened very early in the universe, formed a ton of stars into a very small region. They measured and they uh, able to measure the star formation rate going on in here, um, and again intensely high, another star bursting thing, and looking at the history of it, trying to gauge the ages of, of, of things so that they could try and interpolate the history of it, they figured it probably had to have been going on for about a billion years. So you're talking an intense star formation rate for about a billion years. Now, it wasn't just Hubble that was involved in this study. Um, that star formation rate from Hubble would have actually been about one-sixth of the star formation rate I just quoted to you. Instead, um, they used uh, observations from the Spitzer Space Telescope and from Herschel Space Telescope to look deeper into the infrared than Hubble can see uh, and find more information and the deeper infrared wavelengths uh, that showed that the star formation rate was actually higher than we would have deduced from just Hubble's observations actually about six times higher. All right? um, so by having this incredibly high star formation rate and not being able to see it with Hubble, the implication of that is that there's a lot of dust obscuring this galaxy, okay, or this core of a galaxy. So the, 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 po the postulation, the, the conclusion really, is that the reason we haven't seen these before is that we haven't, uh, that they are highly obscured with lots of dust. There's a tremendous amount of star formation kicking up lots of dust or, uh, within this galaxy. They're heavily reddened and obscured by this dust, and so we're not going to see them very well with visible or with near-infrared light. We need a little bit longer infrared light to be able to penetrate through some of that dust and be able to find more of these cores of elliptical galaxies. Which James Webb will be able to do pretty well. Oh, you go straight to the punchline there. Yeah, there we go. That's that's the conclusion that we have to jump to, right? right. No, simply because we're going to need the longer wavelength. James JWST will have the uh, infrared wavelengths. It will have the resolution of Hubble. It will be able to see objects like this um, much much more easily than either Hubble or Spitzer or or Herschel. Okay. So, so we got a, we got an elliptical here, three billion years after the after the Big Bang. It's been burning. It's been forming stars for about a billion years. Yep. Give us some context. Compare that with our Milky Way. How old is our Milky Way galaxy? And how? how Let's see. The the basic core of our Milky Way galaxy. Um, the basic disk of our Milky Way galaxy we believe is about nine or ten billion years old. So about a billion to two billion years after the core of this elliptical galaxy formed would be when the basic structure of our Milky Way formed. But we, wait a minute, now, so, now, so we've got a galaxy that's very old, and we're still a spiral. I thought ellipticals were among the oldest, and they were among the, they were the result of a lot of galaxy collisions that ultimately did not have stars forming in them, and you've shown us an elliptical that does have stars forming in them, so the processes can't be the same, right? This this elliptical wasn't formed like well, most ellipticals. Well, this elliptical was formed very early. It, it started its formation very early, uh, and had um, and, and 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 could not have formed in a low density quiescent way. Okay, in a if, if a galaxy forms quietly, you know, and things slowly drift onto uh, collapse onto it. Right, the angular momentum of the 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 collapse is going to naturally produce a disk. All right, so okay. spirals form in a, in a relatively quiet fashion. Okay. If you form in a very dense neighborhood, when you get lots of small subclumps that that gather together and smash together, like the early universe, right? The earlier universe, which was was denser, right? Mm -hmm. Then you're going to naturally get a more randomization of your orbits and you'll end up with uh, elliptical shapes. Awesome. All right, thank you. Yeah, God, that makes I understand. That's cool. Thanks. Okay. So uh, the, the, the main question that we want to be able to answer is just how many of these exist? How prevalent are these? Um, can we get lots of baby elliptical galaxies? And uh, uh, how, how, uh, can we really study uh, this as a group? Because if you have one object, okay, that's great. That's a, that's a nice uh, tick mark. You can, I can't, but can you extrapolate from that into the characteristics of a group? No. 
you want to be able to get a group of these, and that is something that we will uh, definitely study with the James Webb Space Telescope. Okay. All right. All right. Let me just, before we leave this topic, Judy has another question, and I just wanted, since it's relevant, I'll bring it up. Judy Schmidt, uh, does this bring us any closer to understanding the origins of globular clusters? I meant this question in reference to the dwarf <laughs> galaxy study, so. Um, so, in terms of the understanding of globular clusters, that's a special uh, topic, okay, because uh, globular clusters can have uh, hundreds of thousands to even millions of stars, and um, we know that the globular clusters in our Milky Way galaxy are all very old, gen uh, all generally very, very old, and that there was a special formation process for these globular clusters about 12 billion years ago, all right, so even a little earlier than this galaxy that we see here. Um, and we've also found that we believe that that when you see evidence of mergers, you also see a higher number of globular clusters. So that globular clusters seem to also be formed during mergers. So the merging sequences can obviously incite the kind of uh, the kind of conditions that form globular clusters. So the formation of a globular cluster seems to be an extreme version of star cluster formation, and we're not exactly sure what the characteristics are of that. Uh, it's still actively under study, uh, um, and this 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 shows us is on, on a much larger scale in terms of the number of stars here. So it gives us some in, in, implication in terms of when the galaxies start forming, but the globular clusters that are small parts of those. Um, uh, it doesn't quite tell us anything about that. Okay. okay. Awesome. Thank you, Judy. All right. So, our final topic for today, um, a space oddity. All right. And um, I'm going to start with a image that you may have seen before. Actually, I hope you have seen before. It's a cool image of a galaxy cluster called Abel 68. And Abel 68 is one of those gravitationally gravitational lensing clusters. All right, and if you don't know what that, know what that means, um, Einstein's theory of general relativity tells us that mass warps space. Actually, that's my favorite three-word summary of general relativity. <laughs> mass warps space, okay? That's, that's all you need to know about general relativity. But in this case, there is so much mass here in this cluster of galaxies that it warps space so much that the light passing through that space changes and diverges, okay? It acts like a lens and it redirects the light from galaxies that are on the far side of this cluster. And there's a really cool effect that happens. You can see um, there are a bunch of streaky things around this cluster, long, thin things. That These are galaxies that are behind the cluster whose light has been stretched out into these long, streaky things by the gravitational lensing of the cluster. But there's also this object right here that I put a box around, okay? Um, and if we blow that guy up, uh, you can see it's got <laughs> a really interesting shape. <laughs> yeah. I... Uh, matter of fact, it doesn't belong in a galaxy cluster. It looks like it belongs in a 1970s video game. Yeah. <laughs> I knew you were going there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely Space uh, Invaders. Uh, so this we call the Space Invader Galaxy. Uh, but, of course, it's not a Space Invader Galaxy. This is not its true shape. It's been gravitationally lensed. You can see the two yellow dots that uh, form the eyes of the Space Invader, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's the same yellow dot, but traveling two different paths through the mass of the cluster, through this warped space around this cluster, it's doubly imaged so that you can see there's sort of a, a mirror reflection um, left to right uh, of the, the features of this galaxy. So the galaxy's features have been warped, they've been changed, and they've been mirrored so that you see two uh, mirror images of it, uh, and then you get this beautiful Space Invader uh, it, it type also shape. Like, I don't know if you ever saw a movie in the 1980s called Crawl. It was this really kind of cheesy fantasy movie. It looks like <laughs> the bad guy in that. He had really big... Uh, Really big horns, and it kind of looks like horns sticking out of his head and everything else. That's kind of what it was. That reminded me of that, too. Okay. <laughs> well, you, you could definitely use this as a, as a, as a bad guy in a movie. <laughs> right, but uh, Abel 68 
uh, has more interesting features than this ad. There's, an, there's another oddity in ABEL 68 that I wanted to point out. Uh, so that one was gravitational lensing, but this one over here yeah, in good. the upper right, um, you can see this galaxy here. Now let me uh, pull that up in big. All right, and you can see this is a galaxy um, where it looks like it's raining, right? Uh, you've got all these sort of droplets coming down, uh, coming down from the galaxy. Um, and we're looking at that. Uh, I have to mute my phone. Uh, anyways, um, it looks like it's, it's raining down. Um, and then that, that looks really strange, too. That's an oddity. What's <laughs> happening here is not gravitational lensing. Uh, instead, the galaxy is moving through the intercluster gas. There's lots of gas in between these galaxies. And that gas is actually ram pressure stripping material out of this galaxy. That's so, amazing. Yeah, so what looks like teardrops falling from this galaxy, uh, this crying galaxy, is actually material just being stripped. So as you're moving through this dense intracluster medium, some of the gas is being stripped, all right, and we're getting star formation in that stripped gas forming uh, these wonderful, wonderful uh, little uh, raindrops coming out of the galaxy or tears flowing down from the galaxy. It's a sad galaxy. <laughs> Uh, so this is a really cool image here in ABEL 68 in that you get to see both a gravitational lensing um, uh, oddity as well as a physics-based oddity. Okay, So with Hubble, we're doing a study looking at gravitational lensing clusters. And in one of the clusters, they saw this. And here you can see this is a cluster that's producing gravitational lensing. If you look carefully, you can see some streaks and arcs. You can especially see this almost circular um, grouping of streaks and arcs around the central uh, center of the cluster. And yep. you say, wow, that's a lot of gravitational lensing going on here, right? Yes. So when you look in the center and you see these blue crazy little arcy you know, things, you immediately think, well, that's got to be gravitational lensing, right? It's not. They did a study with another telescope um, and within the radio telescope to look for it to try and uh, look at the, the details of it, and they proved that it's not gravitational lensing, which makes you go, whoa, okay, now hmm. what are we going to do with this? Because where are you going to get these bright blue sort of spiral-shaped, really long, elongated knots of what look like bright stars here? Okay, so let's just look at it phenomenologically first, okay? This thing is about 100,000 light years long, right? That's stretching from side to side all the way across the Milky Way galaxy. So this is a galactic scale streamer. Um, plus, it's got some spirals shaped to it. It's got a little a bit of a coil shaped, and it seems to be wrapped in amongst these two colliding galaxies. So you've got a lot of this long, thin streamer with this spiraling shape, all right, and then you've got these knots along it. And if you analyze those knots, they uh, believe that these knots are star clusters. Not just star clusters, but super star clusters, like the big star clusters that we saw in the antennae galaxies. So, it's really kind of cool, all right, that you've got this amazing structure and they wanted to do an analogy for it for the press release, and so they took the analogy, uh, well, the physical process behind this is what we call the genes instability, okay? Um, and the genes instability governs when a, a, a cloud of gas becomes self-gravitating and co can collapse down to form stars or star clusters, okay? And so when you get a genes mass of material, then it can become self-gravitating and unstable to forming uh, stars and clusters, right? Um, but that's kind of in this long, thin, um, in this long, thin streamer, you would have separate regions that reach green genes mass criticality and, and then would start to, start to collapse, and that's how you would get these knots along this, the streamer. So the analogy that they used in the press release was with the water coming out of the faucet in your kitchen sink. If you have a smooth, very thin laminar flow leaving your faucet, um, at some point it's going to col collapse in upon itself and form water droplets. Okay, 
this is a well-known physical effect. Uh, and it has a similar analogy of the physical effects as to the formation of these clusters along the long, thin streamer of gas. Now, I have to be totally honest with you, I, it's not an exact analogy in, in terms of physics because the water involves uh, the turbulence within the water and the Reynolds number, um, as well as the surface tension of the water also plays a very important uh, role. And you've got a uh, gravitational field that, that's within. So it's not a perfect analogy here, but it's, it's, it's a useful visual analog for you to understand that these physical processes that happen in your kitchen sink can also happen on scales of entire galaxies. And that's, that's a lot of fun. Yeah. I, was it, I mean, there was just a time when everybody thought that everything happened up in the sky. was, it was The universe was a very static place. It never changed much. And with mm -hmm. over the past 25 years with Hubble and even other, you know, so many other instruments, we're learning that, God, the universe is like completely on just fire is just doing all kinds of things and it's far from static so yeah and you know and educationally it's a fundamental lesson of science that uh, what happens here on earth happens elsewhere in the universe you know that's sort of an assumption we make in science but here's a this is the you know got to be the biggest scale change one of the biggest scale change possible going from your kitchen sink all the way to the scale of an entire galaxy using the same sort of physics showing that, hey, the physics equations work here, they also work there. Uh, that's, a, that's, that's a nice perspective uh, on the universe. I think it's amazing. What did you say? That, did you say what, how far the way this was? What, what, what were the, what, uh, I did you know? not. Um, I've got the press release in front of me here. Uh, zoop, 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 zoop. I mean... Uh, uh, it's just not that critical. I was just trying to get a sense of how far back, you know, after the Big Bang this was. So. Yeah, it's not that far. It's not. These aren't high redshift clusters. Um, okay. So okay. I would say they're uh, definitely less than a redshift of a half. So there may be a couple billion. This is probably a couple billion light years out there. It's okay. not going to be. It's not going to be ten billion light years. It may be two, three billion light years out there. Okay. All right. I was just curious. Yeah. It was because the universe was a lot different at high redshift than it is uh, in, in the lower ones. And so it, you, one can imagine maybe things not working, the, the analogy not working out uh, even more so back then, but it sounds like that's not the issue here. No, this is, is roughly, this is r rough enough to be considered a local universe, okay? Okay, did you have another slide? Okay. I had actually just um, one last question for, to, to, to pose about this. Okay. Why? Um, How do you get... A bad galaxy. No, 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 no. How do you get a 100,000 light year long streamer of gas? All right, no matter what its shape is, no matter what it's done, how do you get that? I'm going to say black holes. <laughs> That's my answer to everything I don't understand. All right, uh, the, the answer is that we don't understand it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, there are three possibilities mentioned in the press release. None of them are compelling. Okay, um, how does material collapse? You, you, you can come up with an idea that material should cool down towards the center of a cluster of galaxies, but that doesn't form it into a streamer. Okay, um, it, you could say that you know this is maybe is a title, the remnant of a tidal tail wrapped around these galaxies, but. You know, the, the kinematics of that doesn't really quite work. Why is it wrapped in between the galaxies and such? Um, there's going to be a lot more study to understand this. Um, so, wait, how sure are they that this is actually not some kind of uh, illusory effect with, the, with you know, the, the line of sight or something? How do they, are they sure these droplets or these blue dots are in between intertwined? Uh, I would believe that the that since they are star clusters, they have emission lines, and they can redshift the so emission. They, they, they can look at the redshift of the emission lines. They can look at the redshift of the galaxies um, and make sure that they are the same. Okay, all right. So they do have sort of a 3D structure to this then by looking at the spectra. So this is one of my f my, my 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 fun points to make is that we don't know the answer, and you know what? That's not bad. That's actually really good. Okay, one, it's job security for us, right? <laughs> right. Uh, but two, when you see something like this, it's your indication that, hey, we don't know what's going on. There's something new to understand about the universe. Uh, we love uh, confronting our ignorance because it shows us there's something new to understand, okay? 
Yeah, I think, was it George Gamow or somebody back in the day said, uh, we know just about everything there is to know, or at least we will in about <laughs> 10 years. <laughs> uh, people have said that over the centuries, yeah. and they've always been so wrong. We figured it out already. We, we know most things. Okay, so I put up the slide that we, uh, we said we would do uh, yep. about the upcoming public lectures. So, so, go ahead. They just wanted to point out to everybody that this little uh, hangout that Frank and I do every month is in conjunction with the Hubble public lecture series that we have on the first Tuesday of every month. But Frank, September 18th isn't the first Tuesday. Not the first Tuesday. We've got a special uh, lecture for you. Um, Ray J. Hanna from York University is coming in. He's giving a colloquium here, a scientific colloquium, and he also agreed to give a public lecture on that Thursday. So I said, great, we'll add you to the schedule. And we have a, we'll have an amazing talk on neutrino hunters, uh, the ghostly particles of neutrinos that you know, you've got a billion neutrinos passing through you every second right now, and you don't feel anything. Uh, but we can also use these neutrinos to unlock cosmic secrets, and he will talk about that. Awesome. Uh, and then, of course, our regular one, first Tuesday of the month, October 7th, uh, Greg Snyder will talk about simulating the universe, the illustrious uh, computational simulation, one of the largest uh, computer simulations of how structure forms in the universe. Uh, he is part of that team, and he will tell you all sorts of secrets of how to make a fake universe and yeah. see if it matches the real universe. <laughs> yeah, I'm really excited about that one because if you haven't heard of this, do a search for it on on on, on uh, Google, and it'll come up. There's a YouTube video that Nature put out that shows this simulation too. It's just amazing. You've got to check. It's one of the neatest things I've ever seen in a long time. So. <laughs> In addition to checking out the public lecture next month, uh, definitely do a search on that. It, you'll, if you haven't seen it yet, it, it's, it's mind-boggling. <laughs> so, okay, Frank, we have a couple of questions here. I want to get to a few things. We're running out of time, um, the, but I'll start with an easy one. This one's from Angel Lights 3. How long does the Hubble take to do a complete rotation around our Mother Earth? <laughs> okay, uh, Hubble uh, does orbits around Earth every 97 minutes. Uh, if you watch the uh, movie Gravity, uh, they put it at like 90 minutes, right? Yeah. Um, and it's actually 97 minutes at the uh, the, the orbit of Hubble. Uh, to be fair, I always say 90 minutes. But. Yeah, it's approximately 90 minutes. So <laughs> we've been talking for almost an hour. Hubble has completed two-thirds of an orbit around the Earth while we've been chatting here. Yep. Good question. Okay. Uh, here's one from... We're getting some questions on this. I'll, I'll start with Stargazer Nation. Uh, what is what is next for the telescope? Uh, any up, up, uploading uh, upcoming highlights? I wonder how close it would focus, and are they going to see Sighting Spring? There's a couple of questions about that, and if you had any news on uh, Sighting Spring um, on that as well. So... Okay. Uh, first of all, Hubble will be observing Comet Sighting Spring. Um, Hubble, the Comet Sighting Spring uh, is going to pass close to Mars. Um, the information on Comet Sighting Spring is that it is not, its coma is not growing as fast as it, one might have thought. Um, so the coma uh, of the Comet Sighting Spring, which I never thought was actually going to encompass Mars, doesn't look like it's going to encompass Mars, although you know the density falls off very, very slowly. So definitely some particles traveling with Comet Sighting Springs will impact Mars, but the risk to the Mars orbiters, etc., is a little lower than uh, and might have been feared. Uh, com Hubble will be looking at the comet itself because Hubble has the best resolution of any telescope here uh, located at Earth, and so we'll, we can't see the full s the the size of Sighting Springs. It's so small. We'll be able to see if any parts, uh, any pieces of it break off, anything happening with the comet. Hubble will be monitoring it during the closest approach. And that, it comes up in October, doesn't it? I think so, yes. Yeah. So, okay, and that is also uh, uh, Janine Bevan, also from the uh, uh, Q&A app, was asking about Sighting Spring. So there you go, uh, folks. Thank you. Good questions. Uh, and um, here's one from Eamon uh, Fanton, who's asking... <laughs> Um, where'd it go? <laughs> it, and then it went away. Uh, come back. Okay. All right. Fine. So, um, 
So Janine, I was also saying, lol, now I'm sitting at my desk coming along to Rubber Ducky. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Rubber Ducky, you're the one. one. You make, you make astronomy fun. so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Now we get to all saying thank you for that. Yes, Rubber Ducky. Okay. I don't know what happened to that question. It had to do with exoplanets, but it disappeared from my Q&A app. I'm really sorry about that. Um, I guess that'll be – so that is it for our time. I don't see any other questions or, or comments that um, I should read out. Thank you all for uh, watching the uh, – for, for participating, doing the Q&A app. I really appreciate that. Uh, we will be back again next month with uh, Frank. Well, no, no, uh, September. Are we, are we going to do this again? Uh, this month, or are we going to just wait till October? Well, we're already into September. This is September. Well, 3rd, I know but we had right? another public lecture, so ah, I don't um, know if you wanted to. I do wasn't planning one. on doing a a huge news summary for the September eighteenth. Okay, um, all right, then we won't worry about that. We'll just if uh, if something amazing happens with sighting springs or anything, uh, we can jump in and do that. Actually, I'll be um, my son's going to college. Okay. Uh, late September, so oh, okay. Uh, okay. we'll have to do it in, in October. Okay. So look, yes. Yeah, so look back for uh, for the next episode of this with uh, Frank uh, at the beginning of October, right after the public lecture series we just talked about. I want to thank you, Frank. This was awesome. As always, you've done an excellent job bringing some awesome stories to us. So thank you very much. Uh, you do an excellent job of uh, asking questions and keeping me honest about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's my job. That's what I do. All right. All right, folks. Anyway, thank you all for watching. And as always, keep looking up.